Welcome everyone to another NASCAR Heat Evolution gameplay video. In this particular video, we're going to look at a couple of things. First, we're going to start off looking at shocks, and then we're going to move down just below that to the weight settings and look at front and rear ride height, particularly the rear ride height. All right, but first things first, the shocks. As you can see by default, I've got everything on 10, bump and rebound front and rear on 10. The reason I did this, this is basically middle of the road. If I go through the individual settings, you can see that I can go as low as three and as high as 24 on any particular setting. So let's start off and make everything three. Now the effect of this, uh, and of course there are many variations you can do with this, adjusting uh, the bump and rebound for each individual corner of the car. Um, you could try to hold the front end down by using as soft as possible right front and left front bump and then using as stiff as possible right front and left front rebound and then with the rear. You could get into all that kind of stuff. But let's just try to keep things simple and have all of them at three. And let's see what that does to the car. Now the effect of this should be, in real life, is it would make the car very bumpy. Because the job of the shock isn't to determine how much weight is transferred, but rather to adjust the timing of the weight transfer itself. So basically, here what I'm expecting to see, I'm trying to let this car go by. All right, what I'm expecting to see from this is that basically the weight transfer has no hindrance. The weight's just going to sling all around the car as I go into and off the corner. All right, so not too bad there. That actually didn't feel bad at all. All right, Brad Keselowski is not going to give us any room, so we'll try to go on the high side here. Let's see what happens here. Okay, so not a lot there. So the response is very muted. Still there. The shocks are basically letting the car do whatever it wants. You're all clear. Oh, and now see, now we're hopping. So we went into the corner, now the car is hopping. Still there. That's definitely not something we want. You're all clear. Now turn three and four wasn't bad at all. So not much to it, but going down into turn one, you'll notice that the car really starts to hop. And here it goes. You can see the car shaking back and forth. Now that's not having a tremendous effect on the grip of the tires uh, as far as through the force feedback or anything like that. I can't really tell a whole lot of difference, but visually it's just shaking the car all over the place. Still there. And that's not something that you want, but otherwise it doesn't drive too terribly bad. Okay, so let's go ahead and try the opposite. Let's max this thing out on every one of the options. Again, there's any number of combinations that you could test out on this. And for those of you who are veterans of racing simulations, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so we've got everything maxed out here. What would we expect? Well, I'm expecting violence, quite frankly. Again, I don't know how detailed the shocks are in this game and what kind of effect they have. So we're going to find out. But essentially, you are almost just using like no, no shocks at all here. They are so stiff. Oh, look at that. See, you're going to get extremely quick transitions. Whereas with very low settings on all of the shocks for bump and rebound, you're going to get a very lazy car. With this, you're going to get violence. Anytime you hit a bump, the car is going to jerk. Anytime there's a transition into off the corner, any type of weight transfer in the car at all, 
you're going to get violence. As you can see, the car is hopping around quite a bit. Now, I have damage turned off for just this very reason. So we can keep going, but you can see the car, at the, slice, the slightest little bit of weight transfer and change of direction, the car gets very jumpy and jittery. So they're definitely, I think we've seen enough there. So let's go ahead and head back to the pits. So what you can see is that going all the way to the bottom and using a, a setting of three on everything, that's going to give you more lazy transitions. You know, the car is not going to react as quickly. It's going to be, you know, you're going to have a lot more weight transfer uh, between the corners. But if you go up too high and get closer to that 24, then you're going to get more violence as the car reacts extremely quickly to any any weight transfer, any change of direction, any input you give the car. So that's why I start out with a 10 on everything. Basically, it's in the middle. And uh, the old saying that I've heard about shocks is that it's hard to dial a car in with shocks, but it's very easy to dial one out with shocks. So you can have an otherwise good setup, shock springs and so on, but you start messing around with the shocks, you can easily dial a car out. So I, I find that in general, this is probably one of the last things you want to mess with. And, and even then, I wouldn't mess with it a whole lot unless you're more advanced. Let's go down to the weight settings section. Now, left weight, this is pretty simple. You can see it's maxed out all the way at 54.2% left weight. On any oval, I haven't come up with a reason yet that you would want anything less than the maximum left weight. So that's pretty simple. Front weight or nose weight, as it's usually called. This is really, it's part preference and part how you want the car to drive, how quick the transitions you want to be. The more nose weight or front weight you put in this car, the more stable it's going to be, but the tighter it's going to be. The harder you're going to, you're, the harder time you're going to have getting it to turn going into and off the corners. So you're going to find that you really abuse the, the front tires much more easily putting more front weight in it. Obviously using 50-50 is neutral for the car. I, I find that a cup car, I usually like to give it a little bit of nose weight, but not more than a couple of tenths of a percentage generally. And again, that's something you can play around with, but generally stay closer to the 50 to 50 and a half or 50.5% nose weight. Wedge, again, can be a personal preference. It really, all of this goes into your total setup package uh, because if you use more or less wedge that's going to force you to change some other things like springs on your car i generally like to run a little bit of positive wedge because it keeps the car more under control and, and it helps me to stabilize how quickly the car rotates in the corner if you want quicker rotations then reduce the amount of wedge you have okay the the less wedge you have percentage wise meaning moving it the number down, the quicker the car is going to rotate. And the reason is a race car doesn't operate front and rear, which is what makes this front and rear ride height a little bit troubling, is that what happens in a race car is you deal left front and right rear behave together, right front and left rear behave together. So when I increase the wedge, in other words, increasing this number, going above the farther I go above 50% that's more weight that I'm putting on the right front and left rear tires which is going to make the car tighter it's going to make it want to rotate less okay and the lower I go on that number the more pressure I'm going to put on the left front and right rear which will definitely help the car to rotate all right front and rear ride heights now in general what you want to do with the race car is you want to maximize downforce on the track, particularly a mile and a half track. Okay, they don't really care a whole lot about drag because they're most interested in getting maximum corner speed. That's what's most going to affect their lap time. So what they want to do is get the front ride height as low as possible. Um, I think I've, I've heard somewhere around a quarter inch for that splitter to be off the ground is about optimal. So in order to do that, you want to get the front end as low as possible. That's done with a combination of static front ride height, which is what you're setting here, and 
your spring settings, which are done here. You can see I'm using 700 pounds on the left front and right front springs. Uh, those are not what I consider optimal. It's just something I was playing around with, and that's where I'm at for right now. But I've definitely got a lot more testing to do with that. So, again, I'm not sure how much this is modeled in the game, but your front ride height, generally, I, don't, I haven't found a reason to raise that above four. Same thing with the rear height, ride height. Now, the, the rear of the car, the thing to keep in mind here are the side skirts. What you want to do with this car, as I mentioned before, you want to get the splitter, the front end of that car, you want to get it extremely close to the ground and keep it there. Okay, That maximizes the front downforce and also minimizes the amount of air that flows under the car. Well, along with that, you also want the rear of the car, if you'll notice the side skirts, that's the very bottom of the car, of the bodywork of the car along the sides, you want to keep that as flush to the ground or as close to the ground as you possibly can the entire way around the track. That will help to maximize downforce and side force as well. So in general, I'd leave that as low as possible as well. Again, that's real life applications. I'm not sure how much of that comes into play in the game. So we're going to test it out. We're going to start out front and rear ride height both at four. Okay, so let's go ahead and save our setup and head out to the track. And I'm gonna head right out on the track and hopefully, so we can get up to speed a little bit quicker and hopefully nobody runs me over while I'm doing this. All right, so remember our shocks are back to sort of a, a default value of 10, just somewhere in the middle basically trying to take them out of the equation. All right, so our front and ride height are both at four right now. The main thing you wanna make sure of is that you're not dragging the ground. First and foremost, you... And because of the way the cameras are restricted in this game and you don't have the ability to have a free look camera, at least that I'm aware of, to keep tabs on your ride heights, uh, and and you definitely don't have any sort of telemetry or anything like that up that I'm aware of. So you have to do it by feel. And as I'm going around the racetrack right now, I don't feel anything dragging. I don't hear anything dragging. And I don't really have a way to see anything dragging unless I go to one of the outer cameras. Now, if I go here, I can see something in the rear dragging. But as far as I can tell, nothing's dragging. All right, from previous experience, I already know that my lap times with this particular setup are gonna be, quickest times are gonna be like a 29.1 all the way up to about a 29.3, just depending on how close to the bottom of the track I get in the corners. So running up, you know, uh, a half a lane to a full lane, I'm gonna be somewhere in the 29.2 to 29.3 range. But another telltale sign that you're gonna have on ride height is how it affects the balance of the car, how it feels to drive. So get a good baseline with where you are and then use the B button to bring up your status indicators in the top left. Now here you can see the tire temperatures. For here, let's focus on the right front and right rear, the middle tire temperature. The middle right now, let's try to get a a glance to see if I can do this as I'm going through the corner. We're at about 197, 198 on the front, and about 198, 199 on the rear. A good general guideline here is if you can keep those two balanced out as close to one another as you can, then that should give you a fairly neutral handling car. The car should rotate well, but not too well, that you start to get loose. But if anything, I would say a car with uh, equal tire temps from right front to right rear should be a little bit on the loose side, but generally not too bad. All right, so as you can see here, we're getting pretty close to equal tire temps between, again, we're looking at the middle temperature on the right front and right rear. So we're pretty close to the same. Okay, so let's make an adjustment. And this time, 
we're going to go to the extreme. I'm going to go from four inches all the way to eight inches. Now, in real life, I can't imagine why anybody would want to do this, but we're going to give it a shot. And you can see immediately, just on pit road here, how it really jacks the rear end of the car up. All right, so let's see if we can get a gauge on how this works out. Again, we're going to head straight out on the track and hope we don't get run over. Now, what would I expect to happen by doing this? I would expect the car to get tighter. And the way you're going to know the car gets tighter, other than the way that the car drives and feels to you, you're going to know by the tire temperatures. So let's see if that happens and see how much of an effect, if any, we actually have from this. Now, already I can feel that it's harder for me to get the car down in the corner. I'm having a hard, the front end wants to wash up the track as I go into the corner. So I'm having to adjust how I drive the car. It's not a, tr a huge difference, a tremendous difference, but it is noticeable to me. So let's take another lap or so. Okay, the car wants to wash up just a little bit, but I find that if I just lift off the gas a little bit sooner on entry, it's not that bad. And of course, they're going to put me straight into the wall because why wouldn't you as the AI? And for some reason, they keep wanting to play chicken with me. All right, so as you can see, if I drive it in deeper into the corner, I'm forced to run the high groove because the car just will not turn on entry. Now, I also want you to keep an eye in the top left-hand corner of the screen as I do this and see how the temperatures of the right front and right rear are behaving. You've probably already noticed that the middle temperature for the right front and right rear are now not doing the same thing they did on the previous run. Now you've got the right front that's now a few degrees warmer than the right rear, which would correspond very nicely with the effect that I mentioned of the car not wanting to turn. The front end doesn't want to grip and rotate as I enter the corner, which is making it harder for me to run lower on the track. Now again, you can adjust for this in your driving if you happen to find that your car is doing that, simply get off the gas earlier entering the corner and it'll give the car a chance to rotate. Now, the downside of this is that in general, it's going to slow the car down having to do that. So here I can adjust and get down in the corner, but if you'll notice the tire temperature, I'm a good four or five degrees warmer now on the right front than I am the right rear. Okay, so let's go back. And see that in general, I haven't seen a real reason to mess a lot with the rear ride height and the front ride height. Basically, I just want to leave those at the very bottom and work with other tools like the springs and the track bar for the most part. But we'll cover those in another video. Thanks for joining. Hope you were able to learn something here. Feel free to leave any comments or suggestions in the comment section below and stay tuned for more NASCAR Heat Evolution videos.